Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Siffy talks. Siffy, Siffy, Sif, Sif. I don't know. I'm just going to say Siffy. Siffy has responded to the last video I made where I explained how there are nonsense, non-cognitive words in 29 of the different surahs of the Quran. He has given his response to this, and I thought it'd be really fun to go through it because, uh, spoiler, it is not not very good. He kind of misses things. So let's go through that. And uh, it also gives me some time to talk about how the Quran's perfect preservation doctrine is complete and utter nonsense and is self-refuting. So let's get into the video. And as soon as you try and translate it, you end up with awkward things like this. Alif, Lam, Ra. These are the verses of the wise book. Alif, Lam, Ra. This is a book whose verses are perfected and then presented in detail from one who is wise and aware. Alif, Lam, Ra. These are the verses of the clear book. You know, it doesn't seem so clear if I... If you can't translate it, I mean, it kind of seems like it's unclear. Huh. But don't worry, that's not a contradiction. As I already explained, they are translated. This argument is made by many Christians trying to claim that the Quran is not clear because we don't know the meaning of these letters. Inshallah, I'll answer this doubt directly. According to Tafsir ibn Kathir, the wisdom behind mentioning these letters in the beginning of the surahs, regardless of the exact meanings of these letters, is that they testify of the miracle of the Quran. Indeed, the servants are unable to produce something like the Quran although it is comprised of the same letters with which they speak to each other. Subhanallah, you only need to go to Tafsir ibn Kathir and you'll get your answer. But for some reason, Christians love to say ignorant and repeat the same nonsensical claims. These letters are from the Arabic alphabet and it is a response to those pagan Arabs who were masters of the Arabic language but claim they didn't understand the Quran and that it was a work of magic. And when our verses are recited to them as clear evidences. They say, this is not but a man who wishes to avert you from that which your fathers were worshipping. And they say, this is not except a lie invented. And those who disbelieve say of the truth when it has come to them, this is not but obvious magic. The pagan Arabs who were masters of the Arabic language gave the Quran a supernatural origin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged them to bring anything like the Quran and they failed miserably. These letters are a representation of the Arabic alphabet. So use them to try to falsify the Quran but you can't. And if you are in doubt about what we have sent down upon our servant Muhammad, then produce a surah the like thereof and call upon your witnesses other than Allah, if you should be truthful. But if you do not, and you will never be able to, then fear the fire whose fuel is man and stones prepared for the disbelievers. And for more than 1400 years, nobody was able to meet the challenge of the Quran. And by the way, whenever these letters are mentioned, they are immediately immediately followed by a mention of the victory of the Quran and explain its miracle and greatness. Alif Lam Ra. These are the verses of the wise book. Alif Lam Ra. This is a book whose verses are perfected and then presented in detail from one who is wise and aware. Alif Lam Ra. These are the verses of the clear book. The same verses he just said are proof against him. al huruf al muqatta'a are always followed by a mention of the miracle of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, I believe I refuted this doubt. So inshallah, next time anyone tries to bring up this argument, you will know how to respond. Okay, so is Sifi right? Is this just that I've just missed an obvious explanation for why the different verses of the Quran don't seem to have any meaning and aren't translated. Well, first of all, let's go to that tafsir he was reading by Ibn Kathir. Because, uh, yeah, I think, he, I think he may have missed some things. First of all, in the actual screenshot that Sifi shows us, it actually says clearly before he reads out the part he wants to get to, the wisdom behind mentioning these verses in the beginning of the surahs, regardless of the exact meaning of these letters. In other words, Ibn Kathir is saying, we don't know what the exact meaning of these letters are. He's trying to give some possible reason as to why these letters might be in the Quran, which he says is wisdom, namely that they testify to some miracle of the Quran, despite the fact that the Quran is the most lacking in terms of miracle quantities one could possibly imagine, and instead has to accept that, yes, there's some wisdom to it somewhere to make the Quran a miracle, but the actual meanings, we don't know. 
And the interesting thing is he actually clarifies before we get to this part of the tafsir, I think Sifi just skipped all the difficult stuff that refuted him and like quote mind this one particular verse, which seems to make sense given that that's what he did to me. So let's let Ibn Kathir speak for himself. Would you look at that? The exact paragraph before the one he read to us Let's read what that says. The scholars did not agree on one opinion or explanation regarding the subject. Therefore, whoever thinks that one scholar's opinion is correct, he is obliged to follow it. Otherwise, it is better to refrain from making any judgment on this matter. Allah knows best. In other words, the scholars don't agree on this. They have totally different opinions about what these random letters are that are non-cognitive. In other words, they have no meaning. In fact, to justify his position, he quotes the following verse from the Quran, Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 7. We believe in it, all of it, clear and unclear verses. All of it is from our Lord. Well, you see, that's interesting because I wouldn't say this is an unclear verse. Well, verse is 29, potentially. Rather, I would say it's a nonsense verse. It actually doesn't have any meaning. It isn't intent to have any meaning. Or if it did, that, ver that meaning has been lost and the oral tradition has failed to preserve it. Or your written tradition. Both traditions have failed to preserve the meaning of the Quran, at least in 29 different places. Let's keep reading. Moreover, the scholars said there is no doubt that Allah did not reveal these letters for jest and play. Some ignorant people said that some of the Quran does not mean anything, meanings such as these letters, thus committing a major mistake. Oh man, Ibn Kathir is calling me out now, I feel personally attacked. On the contrary, these letters carry a specific meaning. Oh, they do have a meaning. Okay, let's read. Further, if we find an authentic narration... <laughs> Listen to this. Look, on the contrary, these letters carry a specific meaning. Further, if we find an authentic narration, if you find one, in other words, you're still looking for one. It's been 1,400 years and Muslims are still looking for an authentic narration that can explain to them what on earth these mysterious letters are. <laughs> if we find an authentic narration leading to the Prophet that explains these letters, we will embrace the Prophet's statement. <laughs> The Prophet made 29 different statements that the Muslim Ummah, the scholars, have no idea what it means. It's gone. The ulama is, is clueless. They have no idea what these things are. Otherwise, we will stop where we were made to stop and just proclaim, we believe in all of it. Okay, what does it mean? No idea. We have tons of different opinions. I can see why Sifi didn't want to start reading the verses before the ones he quoted, because they completely refute his position. Um, even his own screenshot that he took includes the fact that he even Ibn Kathir is saying we don't know the exact meaning. And finally, if you read further up where he starts talking about this topic, we read, The individual letters in the beginning of some surahs are among those things whose knowledge Allah has kept only for himself. Who was that for? Was that for Sifi? Sifi talks? No, no, no. Only for Allah himself. Ah, whoops. So by Sifi trying to give meanings to these mysterious letters, he actually contradicts Ibn Kathir, who says it's only for Allah to know. Kind of sounds a little bit shirky to me. But I'm sure Sifi didn't mean to do that. He just didn't properly read the actual tafsir. Should we go read other tafsirs, Sifi? Let's look at Al Jalalain. Uh, I'm not going to lie. This is my favorite commentary on uh, Surah Al Baqra, Ayah 1. Al Jalalain. Alif, Lam, Mim. God knows best what he means. <laughs> Sorry. God knows best what he means by these letters. Ah. Beautiful. Thank you, Al Jalalain. Really helpful. How about someone more, a little bit more modern? Let's check out Madudi. Let's see what he has to say. But as their use was abandoned with the passage of time, okay, it became difficult for the commentators to determine their exact meaning and significance. An ordinary reader, however, need not worry about their meanings because they make no difference <laughs> as far as the guidance of the Quran is concerned. In other words, he seems to be of the opinion there was a meaning, but it's just been lost. But it's okay because they weren't significant anyway. Verses of the Quran, 29 of them, their meaning wasn't that significant anyway, so it's okay if we don't know today what they mean, because the meaning has been lost. Uh, at least that seems to be what Maududi is implying. So as you can see, quoting from any tafsir, really, will give you the same kind of an understanding that these mysterious letters do not have any known meaning today by any scholars. But let's look a bit broader than this. We don't just need to stick to tafsir, we can actually look at modern scholars today who specialize in this and see what they have to say. This is Dr. Yasser Qadi, an introduction to the sciences of the Quran. We read on page 167 the following. There have been numerous interpretations as to the meaning and purpose of these letters, ranging from the ludicrous. Some Orientalists claim that these letters are the initials of the scribes who wrote the Quran for the Prophet, because that would be crazy, right? That would just be crazy, crazy talk. 
To the sensible, some of the more common interpretations and opinions are discussed below. Well, that's interesting. He gives some a wide range of interpretations as to what these meanings can possibly be. How many does he give? He gives 12. He actually gives 12 different potential interpretations of what these letters could mean. 12. And he's actually shortened it down from a lot more that other medieval scholars had. Explanation number one. These letters, only Allah knows their meaning. The opinion is a very common one, and it's definitely the safest opinion. Interpretation number two. These letters are from the names of Allah. Interpretation number three. Allah has sworn by these letters. Interpretation number four. These letters represent numerical values. Interpretation number five. They stand for specific meanings. Interpretation number six. Esoteric interpretations. Basically, he's talking about how the Sufis might interpret them. Interpretation number seven. They are from the names of the Quran. Interpretation number eight, they are meant to baffle the disbelievers. Interpretation number nine, they are the names of the surahs. Interpretation number ten, they are meant to demonstrate man's limited knowledge. Interpretation number eleven, they are a reference to the other half of the alphabet. Okay. Interpretation number twelve, they are used to attract attention. As you can see, the scholars have nothing but guesswork. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to elaborate, Sifi. I'm glad that I could take this time to go through multiple different tafsirs, not just a very specific quote from one of them, to demonstrate that Ibn Kathir's view is, yes, these phrases, these words have no meaning, and hence they cannot be translated. Now, simply just writing an English transliteration of how you pronounce these letters is not actually translating the word. Sifi seems to think that you can just take these mysterious letters, and as long as you just pronounce them in Arabic, this is a translation. No, that's not a translation, because a translation needs to have context within the words. If the translation itself has no cognitive information in it, then it isn't a translation because you had nothing meaningful to translate in the first place. Case in point, if I said to you, Z, Q, R, what does that mean? And can you translate it into, um, can you translate it into any meaningful sense in any other language? Obviously not, because it doesn't have any meaning in the first place. To summarize, why I think this is important. First of all, the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved in the sense of there are parts of it that seem either by design or through the passage of time have simply just been lost. We don't know what these letters mean. We don't know what they're meant to be translated into. We don't know the meaning. But what's more important, I think, is any interpretation of those 12 that I just listed from Dr. Yasakadi, those interpretations, other than the first one, which is that only Allah knows this meaning and nothing was ever given to Muhammad about what they're supposed to be uh, referencing, what the meaning is supposed to be, you would have to accept that parts of the Quran have been lost. And that would mean that you would have to accept that your doctrine of perfect preservation, letter to letter, word to word, dot to dot, is false. So from a preservation point of view, the safest thing to do is just to say, yeah, they have no meaning. Allah made intentionally, non-cognitive, meaningless, it's not even a word, letters, in the Quran. Now, he tries to make this comparison between these mysterious letters and the Tetragrammaton. yod heh vav -he, the consonants that make up the name of God, as we would typically pronounce it today as either Yahweh or Yehovah. Now, Sifi tries to make a comparison between these mysterious, non-cognitive, meaningless letters and the Tetragrammaton in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, since the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. He says that because the tetragrammaton is yod heh vav -he and doesn't have any particular vowels in it, it's the same sort of thing. It's a meaningless word. Well, that's just flat out wrong. And the reason why is because the verses where the tetragrammaton is revealed to Moses have context. We read in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am, or yod heh vav -he tetragrammaton. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am, again, the tetragrammaton has sent me to you. So what's the context here? Well, God has revealed something directly to Moses. He has revealed a way of referring to him, so a name of him, which he is to use when he goes to the Israelites. Hence, we know the context. We know this is a name. So what, does, what is yod heh vav -Heh? It's a name. Simple. It has meaning and it has context. What does Yasin mean? I have no idea because there's no context to it. All of the mysterious letters are devoid of context. And that's precisely why there's 12 different interpretations by Dr. Yasakadi. It's precisely why some of the best scholars of Islam have told Sifi, Sifi, Sifi directly that there is no meaning <laughs> in these letters. Either there never was, or it's been lost. You pick your poison. Final point I wanted to address. He tries to imply by quote mining and taking my video out of context that I don't think the Bible is preserved. That's not true. The Bible is preserved. I'll say it again. The Bible is preserved. 
I think the way the Bible is preserved is different as a mechanism, as a methodology, to how you think that your scriptures have been preserved. For example, if I show you variants in the Quran, of which there are tons, for example, if you read Daniel Allen Brubaker's book, the corrections in early Quran manuscripts, 20 examples, full color edition, he goes through many different Quranic variants in your manuscripts. If you hold to perfect preservation, letter by letter, word by word, dot by dot, as is now popular to hear online as well as from Islamic scholars in the modern day, again, they never used to believe this back in early Islam, but who cares, I guess, you have a serious issue with any variants, which means you have to argue away how it's just not possible for human, and I repeat, human copyists to make errors when transcribing the Quran. I don't have that issue because I think that meaning is preserved even if there are alterations to a text. Let me give you an illustration. If I had a, if I sent you a message, say for example, I sent you a text message and I said, Chris would like to meet you at 12 o'clock at KFC. I'm getting a little bit hungry now. If I were to take that same structure of sentence and then I would write it in a text form and then I would take out the word at, for example, would I have changed the meaning in the sentence? The answer I think would be no. You can evidently still know what is inferred from the text. There have been tons of examples that people have done over the years to illustrate this. You can take entire paragraphs and you can just swap the letters around and people can still read it pretty easily. In other words, simple scribal errors or changes or omissions or insertions often don't change the meaning. Ah, but what about the parts that do change the meaning? Well, for us, the major doctrines of the church are not affected by such things. You can quote scholars like Dr. Bart Ehrman, who has affirmed that, yes, the major doctrines of the church are not affected by any variants in our manuscript tradition, which we have a very rich tradition. We have over 5,000 manuscripts of the biblical text. So changes to a text don't signify a change to the meaning necessarily. And for us, our primary doctrines that Christ is the Son of God, he is God incarnate, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, who died on the cross, who resurrected three days later, who ascends to the Father and sits at his right side. These are primary doctrines of which are not affected by any changes to the text. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, again, I think Sifi really needs to think about this because I think the writing's on the wall. I think Muslims are going to start sharing the same view as the Christians because there are too many variants in your manuscripts and your history is just poor. Your history is full of people that made changes to stuff or who had different Qurans. Ubay ibn Kaab had 116 surahs in his codex. Abdullah ibn Masood had 111 surahs in his codex. The Quran we have today is 114 surahs. So how did that happen? It's important to note that these differences are substantial and they cannot be reconciled. Massive issue if you believe in perfect preservation of a text. Not really an issue if you believe that the meaning of the scripture is preserved through the text. There's a big distinction there. But I look forward to Sifi not quite comprehending that and, uh, and going at me on that again. I look forward to the response. So what should you do about these mysterious letters? What should you do about the fact that perfect preservation of a text in Islam is a failed doctrine? Well, you should abandon Islam because Islam is not intelligently rational. It is something of which has tons of falsehood that their scholars have to spend a significant amount of their time having to deal with and coming up with alternative theories that are very, very not plausible, let's put it that way, in order to try and save Islam. Really, you should be concerned with saving yourself. Islam will not save you and neither will Muhammad. Who will save you, however, is the true living God, and that is Jesus Christ. No amount of scurrying through tafsirs to find a single sentence that supports your view is going to save Islam. Really, you have to accept Islam as how the earlier scholars saw it and how it's presented in the Quran and Sunnah, and it's presented as a mess. Come back to Jesus Christ. God bless you all. I hope you have a great day. And that includes you, Sifi. Take care.